evening by just letting you know. Uh oh. That was me. No, I'm recording. Okay. <laughs> Um, just letting everybody know that our upcoming topics, we, I, I think I announced last month that we did not have a July speaker, but our magical um, speaker coordinator found somebody. So we do have a presenter for July, and that's going to be Eric Ter Terrell, and he's going to talk about the chemical um, dump site in the oceans near L.A., and um, then we have in August, David Haffey, who will talk about uh, the salmon population in the Northwest. Um, and then that brings us to this evening. And we have Trevor Branch, who uh, is a biologist interested in solving real biological problems through synthesis and uh, mathematical models. And uh, his most recent research focuses on global scale analysis of fisheries. And um, he has a long, uh, standing history in the human side of fisheries, including fishing behavior and fleet dynamics and the impacts of individual transferable quotas on target stocks, fishery discards, and the environment. Um, he's also um, um, has major interests in the status and trends of large whale populations and have let, and these interests have led to an abundance uh, or papers on abundance estimation and changes in population size over time and the separation of blue whale subspecies. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Mr. Trevor Branch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen. I don't okay. know how it's gonna look for all of you, but probably uh, you'll see uh, my screen and I'll be a little thing on the side and you can kind of minimize me so you don't have to look at my ugly face. You can look at the beautiful slides instead and pictures of blue whales. Um, so what I would like to do uh, uh, today is I'm gonna talk about the story of Antarctic blue whales, the largest of them all. And I'm also going to touch on the status of all of the other uh, blue whale populations around the world, just so to give you a broad global scale, um, an idea of where they were all at and what's happening to them, um, including the ones off California. Um, so of course, for those that don't know this, and maybe I'm preaching to the, to the choir here, blue whales, of course, are the biggest animals that have ever lived. And um, they're not just the biggest whales or the biggest living animals, they're bigger than even the biggest dinosaurs that lived in the past. So they're the, the largest animal ever. Um, and they're big enough that I can, of course, give you some really cool statistics, which is one of them is that the tongue of a blue whale is larger than an ele adult elephant. And that a, a blue whale heart is so big and that's a blue, whale, a blue whale heart in a box being prepared for museum specimen preparation. And that white circle over there is a five gallon bucket that's fit, fit inside the aorta of a blue whale, which is big enough and wide enough for a toddler to swim through it. It's 23 centimeters, nine inches in diameter. That's my little toddler there with his scary voice. So if you don't know how to identify a blue whale, I'll give you a very brief identification guide. Probably all of you know how to do this anyway, but mottled gray skin. So if you ever see the side of a whale and has this kind of mottled gray skin they can use for, for ID. Very, very tall blow, that's six meters height, 18, 20 feet height. The drone taking snot samples from the, from the blow above the blue whale in, in the Gulf of California. A very, very small dorsal fin right at the back. Um, that's very uh, seldom visible completely black baleen plates. So if you come across a stranded whale and it has some white, some black, or different colors on each side, it's not, not, a, not a blue whale. Um, and if you're ever to see the underside, the underside is dark. Um, so here you can see two blue whales and one fin whale all um, strapped up uh, and being dragged along by a whaling vessel during the, the whaling era um, from a book called The Whaler's Eye. And if you look at a blue whale and its surfaces, they, I have to admit, they're kind of boring, okay? I'll show you a sequence of pictures, but here's a blue whale coming, surfacing, hitting the surface, the blow coming up, um, moving through. There's the back of the blue whale. You still can't see the dorsal fin. You still can't see the dorsal fin. It's going down already. It's going down and you don't even see the dorsal fin or the tail and it's gone already. So that's very typical surfacing sequence. 
in some parts of the world they do show their flukes, but it's um, very region specific and um, in most areas you, you have less chance of seeing the flukes than just seeing them surfacing like, like I just showed you. And so, of course, faced with this completely magnificent and majestic animal, the 20th century nations immediately asked the question that you're asking too, hopefully not, which is, how can we most efficiently kill them and turn them into margarine? <laughs> really, that's, that's the question they asked. The well products like blue wells were used for lubricants, for lighting, for explosives, soap, margarine, fertilizer, meat, and even to prevent gangrene in the trenches of World War I. And there on the left is a picture of Canadian liquid whale plant food, blue whale, essence of the whale, used as fertilizer. And below it, you can, you can see on the right, whale meat. This is meat, not fish. Economical and excellent for soups, stews, curries, and roasts. Recommended by what is now NOAA Fisheries, the US Bureau of Fisheries Department of Commerce. So the US was actively promoting whale meat as a means to to get protein and, and meat into people's diets. Um, so let's take a step back and ask, what is the history of whaling and how does that impact where blue whales were taken and, and their current status around the world? Um, so of course, we all know the story of Moby Dick, the, the open ocean, the sailboat era, American whalers leaving Nantucket and going all around the, all around the world, including the Pacific Ocean. Everywhere on this map, where it's light blue was a place that one of these whalers went. And everywhere that's another color was where they caught a whale. And the red is right whales, the orange colors are blowhead, bowheads, the, the lilac colors, gray whales, and the dark blue is sperm whales, the green is humpback whales, and the red is, is right whales. Um, and what you can see is that even in that open, open boat era, these whalers went almost everywhere except the Antarctic and the Arctic, um, although even part of the Arctic looking for bowhead whales. Um, and the key to remember is that during this era of whaling, they were only targeting these whales that were slow enough to catch and wouldn't sink if they caught them. So we can, we can roughly think of dividing up whale species into two groups. The one group is the, is the ones that stay and fight if they encounter danger. And those are gray whales, right whales, bowhead whales, humpback whales. They're maneuverable, they tend to stay close to shore. They have stereotypical migration routes. And when attacked by orcas, they will stand and defend themselves. Um, those are the, the sort of fight whales. And those could all be taken quite easily by the sailboat era, the Moby Dick era of whaling. But the, the other group of the mostly rockwell whales are the ones that would respond to danger by flight. They would just flee, swim away as fast as they could. And if you could catch up to them, you could catch them. And if you couldn't catch up to them, then they would escape. And those are the fin whales, say whales, blue whales, minke whales, um, sleek, slender, streamlined. They can swim at incredible speeds. And they could simply outswim the Moby Dick era sailboats. And even if you happen to catch one, it would sink, which is not at all convenient when you're on a sailboat trying to process a, a dead whale. And it was only with the advent of modern whaling that whalers were able to approach and target blue whales and the other similar species. So what I mean by, by modern whaling, I mean, this is the era when uh, you could have a factory boat with an explosive uh, a tipped harpoon on catcher vessels that would go out, fan out and catch whales and bring them back to the, the, the factory boat, haul them up a stern slipway to process them on, on board. And in, in that way, you could go anywhere you wanted to. Um, you could go and, and whale anywhere in the world you wanted to. You didn't need to bring them back to shore to process or have a whale that, um, that floated to process. And the final innovation there was the air pump. So once you killed a whale, you could inflated with air. And, and that's why when you see blue whales from the whaling era, they often look bloated and distended and very, very round. But if you ever see an underwater video of a, of a blue whale swimming, it's slender and flexible, um, not at all like you would see in the, in, in the whale 
uh, photos, whaling photos. Um, so what did this look like, this era of modern whaling? This is all species, catches of all species combined, showing how this spread around the world, initially from the North Atlantic, and in the early 1900s down to the uh, down to the Antarctic around South Georgia. And then as the era of open, uh, of pelagic whaling started, they were able to spread from shore whaling stations all throughout the Antarctic. As you hit World War II, catches plummeted mostly because all the boats were sunk during the war, and, but swiftly resumed after World War II. And, and it was in the late 1950s and 1960s that whaling really spread to all areas of the world. And I'll tell you the reason for that in a moment. But by uh, the moratorium on whaling in the early 80s, whaling again shrunk until it was really only uh, uh, minke whales being caught in the Antarctic and in other areas, plus some bowheads being caught up in Alaska. So if we look just at the catches in the Southern Hemisphere, you can see this progression during modern whaling from the easiest to catch, the humpback whales, to the biggest and most valuable, blue whales, and when those were depleted to fin whales, and when those were depleted to sperm whales, and when those were depleted to say whales, and then to minke whales, going through this progression of all of the, the flight species, one after the other, from the most valuable to the least valuable over time. Um, and you can see the dips in World War I and World War II. And you can see this little box. Uh, I'm not sure if you can, I'll tell you what, I'll do this. This area here is after the moratorium on whaling, uh, showing the catches that currently we're arguing about by Japan and Norway and Iceland and, and the US and others um, catching whales around the world and how much smaller they are than this historic period of large catches of all of the other species. So what happened in, 19, in the 1960s was very important in terms of blue whale conservation. That was when the whalers finally realized that they needed to do something about the depletion of blue whales. And so the International Whaling Commission commissioned this committee of three eminent scientists, literally called the committee of three eminent scientists. Um, Kay Radway Allen, Sidney Holt and Doug Chapman, who was the former director of the School of Fisheries where I now work. Um, and they went off for two years and they used one of the earliest computers with punch cards to collate all the data and come up with recommendations and computer models that they fit. And they found very, very severe blue whale depletion. And they recommended a ban on catching blue whales, which was implemented in 1966. Um, and so you would think that's great. They stopped catching them, they can recover. But that wasn't quite true because what happened was that the Soviet Union had, uh, since the 1950s, been building and deploying the biggest factory ships with the biggest fleets of catcher vessels that had ever been uh, developed to that point. Um, and these catcher fleets could fan out 24 boats, all about 10 miles apart, to produce a line of 200 miles broad, sweeping the ocean for whales. And if they found any, they would converge on any aggregations and catch them. And these Soviet factory vessels and, and fleets did not obey any of the international regulations, including the moratorium on whaling. And so here you can see um, a plot showing where they caught whales of all species on the top and how many of those were blue whales on the bottom. And what I'd just like to draw your attention to is this red line, which shows where you were allowed to, to whale. You were only allowed to do pelagic whaling south of the red line, south of 40 South. But these Soviet fleets ignored all regulations on forbidden species. They went and they caught humpbacks, right whales, blue whales, which were all forbidden species. They ignored the minimum length regulations, 70 feet. They ignored the areas south of 40, and they even ignored the seasons when whaling was allowed and not allowed. They whaled at months of the year when whaling was for, forbidden. Um, and so as a result, there's this extra lump of catches that happened after the moratorium on 
blue whales that we need to take into account when we figure out the status of whale stocks. So let's just take a step back and, and what I'm gonna do is first, I'm gonna tell the story of Antarctic blue whales because those used to comprise about 90% of all blue whales in the world. Those are the blue dots down south you can see there. The red dots are pygmy blue whales. I'll get to those in a moment. There are Northern blue whales and there are Chilean blue whales. And all of these are probably different subspecies or certainly quite separate populations. So let's first look at Antarctic blue whales. Before whaling started on Antarctic blue whales, before 1904, when the whalers set up shop in South Georgia, these were the most numerous blue whales in the world. They were also the largest, by far the largest of all of the blue whale populations uh, individually. Um, we know how many there were in the 80s and 90s because there were these extensive surveys that went all around the Antarctic south of 60 um, under the auspices of the, the International Whaling Commission, the IWC. And they found about 450, 560 and 2,280 in these three roughly estimates about every seven to 12 years. And the question I decided to answer was, if that's how many there were in the 80s and 90s, what did that tell us about how many there were in the past? Can we, can we fit a fancy model, a fancy Bayesian uh, a stock assessment model to these data and other time series of data that we have and try and figure out what was happening to their population over time? And what you find, the first thing you find is that the gray horizontal line here down the bottom is the sustainable rate of whaling. Any dots above this line are unsustainable. And I hope you can see that except for World War II, in every year from 1928 to 1973, including a whole bunch of years after the moratorium on whaling, whaling on blue whales in the Antarctic was unsustainable. And so perhaps it's no surprise that this is what their population trajectory looks like over time. They started off with 239,000 blue whales there, and ended up with 360, way less than 1% of what they used to be, just 0.15%. So I know you're thinking about this and maybe some of you are asking the question, well, how is it possible that they were still making money once they depleted these Antarctic blue whales to such low levels? And the answer is that it's actually explainable. Um, if they were just targeting blue whales, it's not explainable because it would be so prohibitive to go and find the last blue whale that it just wouldn't make any money. So extinction shouldn't be profitable. But when the blue whales were declining, they weren't targeting blue whales. Uh, so here are catches of blue whales and blue fin whales and, and light green sperm whales and dark green and humpbacks in, in, in purple. And what you can see is that during this era when the blue whales were being most depleted, the whalers were not targeting blue whales, the whalers were targeting fin whales. And if they happened to come across a blue whale, they would catch it. So the fin whales were in some sense, they were, they were subsidizing the continued exploitation of blue whales and, and some other species. Um, and it turns out that this, this mode, this mode, what I call opportunistic expo exploitation with it, where you will just catch something if you happen to encounter it, but you're really targeting something else. Um, it turns out you can find case studies of this in many other different animals um, where, where there's poaching of rhinos and they're actually targeting elephants once the rhinos get down to low levels, but sufficient to render a, a, a rhinos extinct in Zambia through this mode. Uh, they're targeting of rare and valuable sea cucumbers, and then those go down to low levels, so they start targeting more common, less valuable ones while still taking the, the really valuable ones. Chopping down of mahogany trees, uh, blue whales, of course, poaching of, of wild pigs, and even some bycatch issues in, in fisheries. All of these, this kind of mechanism is quite common all around the world once you start looking for it. 
So that's the depressing news. What about what's happening now? What happened after this period of massive decline? What happens if we zoom in on this little period where the, where the whales are down at low levels? What can we say about current trends and, and where Antarctic blue whales are going? And it turns out that they're recovering. And they're going up at about seven or eight percent a year. Um, if we extrapolate forward, there might be as many as 4,000 to 10,000 now. Um, and this increase rate we see in other time series too. And, and you might ask yourself, well, okay, so they're going up this at very, very low levels. What does this say about sex ratio? What does this say about genetic structure? The answer is sex ratio is a bit puzzling. You might expect that if you're catching all the big whales, that the females would be targeted and you'd end up with no, with no big females. But it turned out that actually towards the end of whaling in the 50s and 60s and 70s, they were catching more females than ever before. So wherever those, those points are below the dashed line, there are more females. The ones in red are significantly more females. The ones in, ones in blue are significantly more males. And in most whale populations, we expect slightly more males than females, just like we, we have in, in humans. Um, and for much the same reasons that, as I humorously put it, because males take more risky behavior and die young. Um, and perhaps the same thing happens in whales too. Um, so I presented this work and um, it was kind of interesting at the, at the International Whaling Commission, I, um, I encountered some skepticism. People said, well, they can't really be increasing. They're at such low levels, they've been depleted so far. There's no ways they're increasing. Maybe what's really happening is that pygmy blue whales are migrating south into the Antarctic and we're just picking up pygmy blue whales. Um, and for those that don't know, pygmy blue whales are the really small ones. They don't get much bigger than about 80 feet, um, 24 meters. So they're only just bigger than all the other whale species. Um, but they, they usually stay north of 52. So if we look, go back at our map, the red dots are the pygmy blue whales, the blue dots are the Antarctic blue whales. Could the pygmy blue whales have gone south and just be uh, found in the surveys? And so what we, we think as is an increase is not actually. So this, this was the hard problem to, to look at because how do you figure out if something really happened in the past? Um, the first thing I did was look at, well, where do we see whales now? Are they separated? So there's some data from Japanese scouting vessels that shows that pretty conclusively where you find blue whales in, in recent decades is up here where the pygmy blue whales are and very seldom down here where the Antarctic blue whales are. And there doesn't seem to be a big southward movement of the pygmy blue whales in the recent data. Or if we look at all data combined from sightings and catches, we see that where we see sightings in blue, the circles in blue versus the catches in red, pretty much the same areas. There's no area where they've been extirpated completely compared to where they were caught. And most of the, the differences here are just due to changes in sighting effort. Um, and I should say one of, the, one of the things that happened when I did this compilation was that I discovered there seems to be a, a pattern between the Australia and Indonesia sightings and strandings and catches up here that hadn't been identified before. And I was super excited to see when they put satellite tags on these whales to see this connection perfectly matching what I had in my paper. Um, it's very seldom that you ever make a, a prediction in a paper and it comes out so perfectly from, from recent data. So anyway, let's, let's go back to this question of pygmy versus Antarctic. And it occurred to me at the time that if you go and look at the catches in different places, you would be able to tell if they were pygmy or Antarctic because pygmy blue whales are shorter. So if you had a population that was 100% pygmy blue whales, they would all be in these shorter lengths. And if you had a population that was 100% Antarctic blue whales, you would see it be these larger lengths. And if you had something that was 50-50, you would see two humps in your distribution, one at the lengths you'd expect for pygmy down here, and one at the lengths you'd expect for Antarctic blue whales over here. And I thought, well, I can go back and look at the data and see if this is true and, and estimate 
the proportion that might be pygmy based on this kind of idea. And it turns out that pygmy blue whales have this kind of distribution over here in the Indian Ocean. And everywhere you looked in the Antarctic, there was no evidence of a bump down here for pygmy blue whales. Everywhere you looked was pretty much all um, Antarctic size individuals. And when you get an estimate of that, it says that almost nothing, less than 1% pygmy blue whales in the Antarctic. Uh, I should point out a couple of things here. You might think it's easy to measure the length of a blue whale. It turns out it's not. The, the yellow bars that I highlight here are five foot intervals. And you can see that those have a slightly higher peak than the surrounding one foot intervals. And that's because a lot of the whalers couldn't be bothered to measure them to the, to the nearest foot. They just measured them to the nearest five foot interval and recorded that instead. And you can see the pattern very clearly in the data of, of that, uh, that finding. So the next thing that occurred to me was a really weird thing that I did. Okay, this is a picture of the ovaries of a blue whale. The big lump over there on the left is what's called a corpus luteum. And this is something that forms in the ovaries of whales and of humans too, just ours are much smaller, um, when they're pregnant and they're producing extra hormones to keep the pregnancy going. And it turns out that this big corpus luteum is so big <clears throat> that after the pregnancy, it dwindles down to the size of these little lumps over here. Uh, let me put my pointer on. These little lumps over here, which can be counted, and each of these signifies a previous possible pregnancy. There's one that's the most recent one that hasn't been, been uh, made small yet. So you can go and you can count these lumps, and you can figure out how many pregnancies each whale has had. And when you plot them in different areas, so this is by length, and that each point is the number of these ovarian corpora that there are, you can see that in the Antarctic region, there's a circle of points that's very different to those in the pygmy region. And you can use the same kind of idea just used with lengths to estimate how many pygmy blue whales there might be in the Antarctic. And the answer again is very, very close to zero, much less than 1%. <clears throat> So we can conclude that Antarctic blue whales are recovering, but they're still at very, very low levels. <clears throat> now, what about some of the other areas? What about Chilean blue whales? What's the status of Chilean blue whales? And it was very interesting when I did that length separation between pygmy and Antarctic blue whales, I also plotted the, the Chilean catches and to my surprise, I found that those whales are perfectly in the middle of pygmy and Antarctic blue whales. So if we accept that pygmy blue whales are a subspecies and Antarctic blue whales are, are a subspecies, this is pretty good evidence that Chilean blue whales don't belong to either of those two subspecies and maybe they should be considered a separate uh, subspecies. Um, we need to wait for a type specimen and, and some other stuff before someone can really identify this, but it's it's an intriguing idea. Um, and we can, we can go and look at Chilean blue whales. There is um, some information about them. Um, they're genetically distinct. They have a unique song type. They're geographically separate. Their lengths are intermediate. And there's a little bit of morphometric data suggesting that um, while pygmy blue whales have shorter tails than Antarctic blue whales, when you go look at the data, the Chilean blue whales here are, are blue circles. The pygmy blue whales here are red circles that are clearly quite different. And the little crosses are Antarctic blue whales. And it seems like the Chilean blue whales are more similar to the Antarctic blue whales in terms of their, the size of their tail as a proportion of their whole body, but not that different um, in terms of their distance between the snout and their eye, the, the, the end of the rostrum and their eye. Um, and we can go, we can look at the abundance estimates. We can find the historical catches. There are just under 6,000 catches taken from this area. Current abundance estimates are a minimum of 570 to 760. And fit a model for these that suggests they're nowhere near as depleted as Antarctic blue whales were. They're at least above 25% of pre-whaling levels. Remember that Antarctic blue whales are down at under 
Um, so what about blue whales off your coast? What about Northeast Pacific blue whales? How are they doing? Now, we looked at this a few years ago and the hardest part was figuring out which catches came from the Northeast and which catches came from the Central and Western North Pacific, which we think is a separate uh, population. And we know this because there are two very distinct songs that are heard throughout the North Pacific. Here in blue, this is work by Anna Surovich. And um, the blue locations are where you hear the Northeast Pacific song. And the red locations are where you hear the Central and Western North Pacific song. And there's one extra song heard in one location off Japan that could represent a third population, but it's much more uncertain. But we can fit a smooth surface to all these songs in different places and use that to separate the catches out. Um, so here are all the historical catches. Now in blue are the ones we're certain are Northeast catches and red are the ones that we're certain are Central and Western. And the ones kind of in faded colors in the middle, we're not that certain, they could be either one. Uh, but that gives us a way of separating these catches out into two time series where the blue catches and the bottom are the Northeast Pacific and the red catches are the the central and western. Once you have the catches, it turns out to be relatively easy to fit some models to these. We have abundance estimates, we have some catches, and it turns out, and this, I must say, really surprised me. I, having had the experience of Antarctic blue whales, I expected the Northeast Pacific to be extremely depleted, and it turns out that they've pretty much recovered to how many they were before whaling started. They were perhaps 2,000 some before whaling started and they're about 2000 some now. Um, and, and even with the increase in, in ship strikes that doesn't seem to be depleting the population down now. And, and I will say that since we did this work, they've updated all these abundance estimates and it does seem to, they do seem to be increasing at about two to 3% per year over the last 15 to 20 years. So this is, this is really good news. If you're a, if you're a blue whale biologist, this is about as good news as you're ever going to get that at least one population is doing uh, doing pretty well. Um, so what about some of the other populations? Now, we really don't have a good idea what's happening to pygmy blue whales. And I will say that in this area of red, it's nowhere near as simple as the other ones that I've talked about. In the area of red, we there are at least six different song types heard, possibly seven. The seventh, we're not sure if it's a blue whale or not. That, that's even newer than this work. And, and you can see from these spectrograms, each of these is a 450 second interval. And, and note that over the course of 450 seconds, which is seven or eight minutes, some of these populations are only making two calls. They're very deep. They're very elongated and prolonged calls that they make. And they make them over and over and over and over again. Um, it seems like only the males make these these loud songs. I, I joke that they're they're mansplaining or they're they're saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And the and the female blue whales are like, keep quiet, and they won't know where we are. And the males just keep on calling and calling and calling and calling. It must eventually work because um, they they certainly are successful at, at, at finding mates. Um, but we can do the same thing we did in the North Pacific and we can use these songs, but it, now it's, it's much harder to do this because now there are all these different calls. Um, so here are some data that we have uh, from the Indian Ocean where all these pygmy-like populations occur. So for example, you can see that the, this call type, which we call the Oman call in the Northwest Indian Ocean only occurs up here. The Central Indian Ocean or Sri Lanka calls in this area. The southwest or Madagascar is over here. The southeast or the sort of Australian Indonesian population is over here. Antarctic blue whales, they're loud and they're heard everywhere. I can't really explain, they're just heard everywhere. And then there's a little blotch over here for the New Zealand, the southwest Pacific blue whales. Um, so we can take these data and by month fit a spatial surface. So this is just the spatial surface for the the Madagascar, the Southwest Indian Ocean population by month. 
and use that to predict where we think this population occurs in each month and then apply that for all the other populations all the other months and apply all that information to the catches to come up with something that looks like this. So here are in the darkest color the, where we think catches of each population were taken and where they sort of fade into light colors is where we're less certain about whether those catches were from that population or not. And I will say that I am not a very good spatial modeler and I'm not very happy with the spatial model fits that we got, but this is the best we've been able to get so far. There's still a few spots that I'm not that happy about, but this seems like a reasonable model fit to the data and where each of the populations occur, and hence how many were caught from each of these pygmy blue oil populations. Um, so this is the sort of one piece of the puzzle we need to assess their status. The other piece is we need abundance estimates in recent years, and we simply don't have good estimates for these populations. Um, so it's logical to think that the New Zealand ones are probably doing okay because only 400 something were caught. And maybe the ones off Madagascar are uh, in less good shape. But it might be that there were a lot more blue wells off Madagascar than there were off New Zealand. And so it's a little hard to figure out if there was just a, a big population that's little depleted or a small population that's very depleted without the abundance estimates. But this does give us what I have summarized as the best available picture of where all these populations are right now. First, the Antarctic, we know they're down at very, very low levels, extremely depleted, but recovering at about 7% a year. We know that California blue wells are pretty much back to pre-whaling levels, about 2,000 or so, um, and doing pretty well, still increasing despite ship strikes. Uh, we don't know hardly anything about the Central and Western North Pacific. Probably they're quite depleted. We don't know much about the North Atlantic, but uh, they're increasing, but probably they are depleted. Uh, Chile seems to be at least above um, about a quarter of the pre-whaling levels. Um, we know nothing about those off Oman, very little about those off Sri Lanka, very little about those off Madagascar, very little about those off Australia. Um, but we can infer that the New Zealand blue whales are not that depleted because there are 720 at least there now and only about 500 were caught. Um, so we can summarize all of this by saying, I think there are about 10,000 to 25,000 blue whales now. And as a global population, they're still way down at less than 10% of their pre-whaling levels, but probably increasing everywhere. There's the most, most likely that they're increasing everywhere. So there's my status. I blew through a bunch of stuff. I'm happy to answer as many questions as you want. I have a bunch of people to thank, who are my numerous co-authors on the various papers, especially Kate Stafford and Anna Surovich, Cherry Allison for the catches, and Daniel Palacios for Oceanography, Rob Williams and Cole Monaghan, Luis Pastini and Jorge Acevedo for the morphometric analyses and too many others to thank for the acoustic contributions um, to the, the last paper I've talked about. Uh, where I did get funding, it was from the International Whaling Commission. Mostly this was just a labor of love though, done in my spare time. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions you have. I'll uh, open that up. Uh, Trevor, I'll go ahead and sort of moderate for you if you don't mind. And oh, yeah. I encourage I encourage people to put their questions into the chat room and I'll do my best to send them his way. So Kim says that she was in Santa Cruz and shot a picture. I'm, I'm assuming of something that might be a blue whale. And her question are, are blue whales in the Santa Cruz, California area? Yes, they are. Um, the, the, these blue whales will go, uh, most, most of them go down to Mexico, Gulf of, <clears throat> the Gulf of California. And then they come back up to California. Most of them stay in California. Some go up to Oregon, occasionally Washington, BC, even the Gulf of Alaska. And sometimes they make these meandering pathways that go all almost out to Hawaii. Uh, but I think those are, they're either lost or they're bored or they couldn't find any food off California and they went exploring. Um, and sometimes they go down as far south as 
um, an area west of Costa Rica called the Costa Rica Dome that's um, got a lot of food for them to eat down there. Um, I think they pretty much just go wherever there's food, summer or winter. And if there's food, they, they eat. And if there's no food, they, I guess they just call over and over again and wait for the females to, to accept their calls. <laughs> um, Leanne asked, uh, you indicated fluking was regional, regionally specific. Which region are you most likely to see blue whales uh, show their flukes? Um, off Sri Lanka, they seem to do it pretty often about, um, I think it's something like 40 to 50% of the time when they when they dive, they show their flukes. Is and, there anything, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I don't know why. I don't know why some some areas, do, maybe, they, maybe it's just uh, the feeding depth that they're feeding at. I was just if gonna you, ask, is there something specifically deep there that they need the extra boof to get going? I don't know. I mean, they do fluke um, more of California than they do in the Antarctic as well. Um, mm -hmm. And it might just be that where the food is shallow, you you just slip under the surface and you and you feed. And where the food is deep, you want to get your head down and so you fluke up. Um, I haven't heard a satisfactory explanation for that yet, though. And our uh, national president, Uko Goiter, has uh, uh, joined us. And he's asking, is there a consensus on species subspecies definition for blue whales? <laughs> If you ask 10 blue whale scientists, they'll give you 20 answers. <laughs> and I could probably account for about five of those. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. the answer is that they're all one species. Um, we definitely think that uh, pygmy blue whales and Antarctic blue whales are different. And that Northern blue whales have always been considered a separate subspecies. Um, but it makes no sense to have North Atlantic and North Pacific be the same subspecies to me. They're yeah. completely separated. They're genetically distinct. They make different calls. It, it, you know, it doesn't make any sense to me. And then, of course, Chilean blue whales are are different in all sorts of ways, genetically, song type, lengths, and so on. And some people think there's another subspecies in the North Indian Ocean. I am very skeptical. I just call all of them a version of pygmy blue whales. And then once you dig down, you know, then it gets it gets messier because there are all these different acoustic populations. So, so I think I think probably the easiest way to think about it is there's a species and there are 11 or 12 or 13 acoustic populations that make diff distinctive songs and that's how they would keep separate. Mm -hmm. um, and then how you classify all those into subspecies is a total mess, total mess. I, I would just ask what my own question is, is there any speculation whether Chileans are a hybrid? I don't think they are. Um, okay. I think they would pick that up genetically uh, right. if they were hybrid. Um, and Bonnie, been, yep. okay, go ahead. Bonnie is asking, uh, do you think the increase in krill harvesting is already impacting blue whales anywhere? And then she has a second question that is uh, blue whale song, are blue whale songs as complex as humpbacks? <laughs> um, so the krill question, um, most of the krill that's been caught in the world has been caught in the Antarctic in a, in a fairly localized area around the Antarctic Peninsula. And, and we think the best estimates are that there are something like 500 million tons of krill every in, in the Antarctic at any point in time. And the catches are of the order of about 5 million tons. So they're catching about 1%. And the, the, the quota on krill is, I think, eight or nine million tons. It's about 2% at most. So it's very unlikely that even in those localized areas that there's enough krill being caught to cause a, 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 you know, a supply problem or feeding problem for, for any of the whale species there. Um, bearing in mind that there used to be 50 to 100 times more blue whales, they're all catching krill catching a lot of krill. And so you would think that there are more krill now than there used to be when blue whales were at high levels before whaling. So I don't very think good. that krill, yeah. krill catching is a problem. Yeah, very good, interesting. Yeah. George, George, one of our San Diego board members is asking, given the depth of depletion in the Antarctic population over time, how does that impact your ability to do comparative stats 
between that population and others that are far less depleted, uh, i.e. pygmy Chilean? Oh, in terms of doing, doing the analyses that I did in, in terms of pygmy. And, well, one of the things I did was that um, I was able to look at the proportions of pygmy uh, blue wells in the catches over multiple decades. So starting in the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, when the Antarctic population went down, you know, 99.85%. But the pygmy population hadn't even been discovered until the late 1950s. And so if, if there was a case of pygmy blue wells moving down south during that period, it would have been picked up in the analyses and there was no sign of any change um, over those decades. I mean, it could have happened more recently than that, but but I I don't think so. And the genetic samples we're getting from the Antarctic don't appear to show um, sizable numbers of pygmy blue wells. Um, uh, but I was, there was, there was a, 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 just to follow up on the previous question about the song of blue wells versus the song of humpback whales. Just like blue wells being boring at with their at surface behavior compared to humpback whales. Blue whale song is very boring compared to humpback song. Humpback song is, is like a, a CD playing for an hour with cha changing calls and song. And, and from season to season, they change their song and they pick up song from other populations. We don't think blue whales do that. We think blue whales are pretty boring. They just keep on saying the same thing over and over again. Presumably some variants of pick up the phone, pick up the phone, pick up the phone, pick up the phone. I, I don't know what they're saying. Hi, of course, yeah. bowheads Hi, are the there. most interesting. Yeah. Bowheads yeah. are like jazz musicians. They have different calls from individuals by year, by season. But anyway. Um, I was fascinated. My question, I was fascinated with uh, the amount of uh, whaling data you were able to get to. I don't know if this is a classified secret, but um, how in the heck and especially when you had uh, Russian illegal data, you know, illegal hunting and got access to that data. I mean, is that all through the International Whaling Commission? I mean, they were people were pretty open about this. Yeah, there's a very interesting story that and I, I, I would have talked about this if I'd, if I'd had more time, which is that the International Whaling Commission has a big database of all the catches, individual whales, species, sex, location, date, uh, pregnancy status, male, female, um, and uh, uh, when the the Soviet uh, Union was doing all the illegal whaling, they were reporting data that was completely made up to the IWC. <laughs> uh, they were they were reporting about the right amount of whales summed up in terms of biomass, but they would report two fin whales for every blue whale they caught, and they would report a bunch of say whales instead of you know. Uh, humpback whales and so on, uh, but in, it, but when 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 uh, the Soviet Union opened up uh, Glasnost, Perestroika, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, their whaling biologists admitted to all of this campaign, and they brought forward these old um, logbook data for individual whales that they had. Some of them had kept, and they brought them, and they and they painstakingly been entered and added to the database. We don't haven't got everything, but we got about 90 to 95% of the data back. And so when I did the study on, on the ovaries, I was sent a chunk of, I don't know, about a thousand pages of Russian logbooks where I could go through and each line was a whale and wow. I could find how many corpora lutea they found for that whale and put it in my database to use in the analysis. So that's, that's what I used. That was the Let's just say it's it's not fun to look through page after page after page after page of illegally caught whales and realize that many of these were rendered almost extinct because of the Soviet whaling. Yeah, it's not not an easy thing to do, but information is very useful. Um, a few more questions, and that is uh, Bonnie wants to know: do, do the blue whales stop eating when they go to breeding grounds like humpbacks and grays, or do, are they feeding all? all the time um we used to think that especially for antarctic blue was which would go from south georgia and antarctic up to the coast of south africa um and and namibia and angola and all the whales they caught there had basically no food in their stomachs 
And so it used to be, they used to think that blue whales would fatten themselves up for six months and then starve themselves for six months. But what's really striking is that everywhere blue whales go in, in the winter months are places where there's lots of krill and lots of food. And I think it's much more likely that, that they don't feed very much in the winter months, but if they come across a dense aggregation of krill or something suitable, they'll snack on them. Um, and it's very, just very striking that they, they don't occur anywhere where there's not good upwelling. So you, you don't see them on the east coast of, of Africa very much. You don't see them on the east coast of South America. You don't see them on the east coast of, of Australia. Um, you see them in great abundance on the west coast where there's all these upwelling and good conditions of both Chile and California and South Africa and Australia. That's where they're very abundant. So right. I think they're going places where they could eat if they wanted to. And I think our local uh, whale watch skippers would probably confer that they're seeing them most of the time at the uh, drop offs and where there's good upwellings and stuff. So, uh, yeah, certainly in California, they're definitely feeding there. Yeah. Uh, Carrie, one of our board members, is asking, she said, uh, My first blue whale encounter was with Delta, who showed her flukes often. She has since passed, and I haven't seen many flukes with other blue whale sightings off San Diego. Could it be an individual whale choice? I'm sure it is. Yeah, absolutely. The, the more, the more you, you study them, the more you see individual whales, the more you realize they have personalities. Yeah. yeah they're, they have unique individuals. And maybe, maybe some individuals, um, you know, fluke when they go down. Maybe some are, are used to feeding down deep. Um, Maybe some are, are vagrants that like to explore and some of them are homebodies that always go back to the same place. I think there's a lot to be learned from, from studying individual, individual whales and, and we don't have the same individual studies we do for North Atlantic right whales or for resident um, killer whales. But you know, someone like John Callum Bakitas has done an amazing job and Diane Gendron at finding individual whales and identifying them year after year after year. And there's some staggering work being done at, on photo identification and seeing where whales go and tagging them and so on. And well beyond anything I'm capable of doing, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then um, another question my, uh, from me, and that was on the uh, data that you had related to the sound arrays. Um, are, are those, do they have uh, permanent sound arrays dispersed out there or are those ship based and then uh, because these animals are able to send a signal a long ways how much confidence you have in putting a dot on a map uh, that's where the whale was <laughs> those are great questions um i do have some ship based um you know just throwing some buoys off off the back um there are some data from those that are just at that point in time whether it calls but most of those circles are, are permanent moorings or that they go and they retrieve them every year and collect the data and the best data are from a French um, program called the OHASIS Bio um, program out in the middle of the Indian Ocean where they're studying, mostly there to study uh, some combination of seismic activity and um, nuclear weapons testing and well calls as a, as a side interest. Um, so they can, they can get very long-term deployments. And there's a similar one off around Australia's coast that are permanently deployed in, in different places. Uh, yes, you can hear them from far away, certainly hundreds of kilometers under favorable, favorable conditions. And maybe you can hear Antarctic blue whales from much further away than the other populations. So there's, there's a question there, but it's, it's also true that, you know, you, if you could hear them from thousands of miles away, you would hear the whale calls on all the hydrophones, but you don't, you only hear them in some of them. So it's clear that, that the range is more in the, you know, around a hundred kilometers, maybe a couple hundred under favorable conditions, maybe less under unfavorable conditions. Um, very dependent on where the hydrophone is deployed, the uh, bathymetry in that area, if it's complicated or not, if it's in the sound channel, the, the, Acousticians, passive acoustics people will tell you that I'm way oversimplifying the, the scenario. <laughs> well, 
we appreciate you oversimplifying it so that <laughs> we, we can understand it. That's really good. Um, I have run out of questions that were in the chat room. Um, you are, um, oh, wait a minute, I got one more. Troy from uh, one of our members who has a whale watch operation here in San Diego says to please invite uh, Troy to San Diego. We are seeing up to 20 blues a day right now. Uh, we would be happy to host him on their boat. They got a beautiful sailing vessel, Troy. It would be worth it would be worth uh, you know telling the boss that you need to come down south and look at blue whales. So that's a wonderful offer. Thank you, Troy. For doing Thanks. That. that sounds fabulous. Yeah. So uh, what's the name will, of the operation? I'll put you in touch. I'll put, <laughs> you in can touch I come visit? <laughs> I'll put you in touch with Troy as well. My experience is that whenever I go somewhere, the whales disappear. Uh, as any good biologist, <laughs> uh, anybody that's done field field work would would agree that that's probably that's probably the same the same thing. Uh, one of our members wants to know if you have any auditory uh, recordings of a blue whale song. Would would could we that you could share? Do you have anything you could share with us tonight? I don't have anything lined up. Um, okay, not a, not a problem. You can you can go to YouTube and 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 search for Antarctic Blue Whale Call. Perfect. Um, and you'll hear some of the songs there. Um, what's really interesting is that if you play them at the speed they're they're made, they're so deep that you wouldn't be able to hear them at all. You could only really hear them if you have a really really good subwoofer, and you crank the volume up super high and you might be able to feel the ground vibrate around you mm -hmm. or feel some very very deep sounds but uh, uh, it, as you get older you lose your hearing in the deep part of the sound frequency so typically when you want to listen to what they sound like you speed them up 10 times and then and then the antarctic blue whale sounds like a whoa 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 mm -hmm. something like that it's, that's a that's a male going woe is me you know exactly <laughs> Do um, do killer whales uh, for, from Dr. Coyman at Scripps? Do uh, killer whales have much impact on predation and in which region? Killer whales and blue whales. Um, well, there have been recorded attacks, um, likely some successful by killer whales on um, on blue whales. There's a famous article in 1979 in the National Geographic, um, off I think believe it's off California of a of a a pack attacking um, a, a big blue whale. And there was a recent case of Australia one. Um, so it's certainly possible. Um, I suspect that the, the loss to orcas is quite low. They do, they do have a lot of rake marks, which suggests that they often are attacked by orcas, but I, I don't think that the attacks are very successful very often. Very good. Well, you've gotten a lot of kudos. If you get a chance, you can look at the um, uh, chat room, but there's lots of people thanking you for, and we as ACS San Diego, thank you deeply for your wonderful presentation today. It was really, really wonderful. And I'll give it back to Leanne to take us home. Yeah, thank I just wanna say thank you very much. I know a lot of um, our members are naturalists and um, boat and uh, whale watching trip operators and we're getting into our blue whale season so this is excellent thank good you luck. very much have a great day yeah you too good luck thank with you. the whale watching thank you yes good night everybody uh, we'll see you uh, next month thank you thanks for listening <laughs>
you know, you've been quite prolific. So uh, I got to look that up. Got to get back and read a little bit more now. <laughs> so thank you very much. Yeah, if anybody wants copies of my papers, I'm more than happy to send them to you. You can oh, just Google wonderful. me and you'll find my email address on my faculty website. Oh, that's what very, I would like good. is if you could send a couple of the um, blue whale pictures that you have, because we do um, our uh, spy hopper journal, quarterly journal. And what I do is like a summary of your of your presentation, and then I include your photo, and then a couple of your favorite blue whale photos. Um, so if you could send me a couple of those in um, JPEG format, that would be great. And I love this fluke that you caught um, the last photo. Um, that's really cool. It's an unusual angle. <laughs> I love, I love that picture too. What you have to realize is that is that I'm not an I'm not a naturalist. I'm a total modeler who sits on my computer all day and plays with data. Okay. Which turns out to be the one thing that everybody who loves working on whales hates doing. Right. Everybody <laughs> collects all the data and they hate analyzing it. And I like yeah. analyzing it. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm gonna so I'm gonna these... I'm gonna suggest <laughs> that your first pick when it comes to picking the team, because we want definitely want the data guy. I'm, I, I picked Trevor to be on my team before I yeah. get the rest of the naturalists because I want that data guy before we get all the people that want to be in the field. So right. truly, you're yeah, you're going to be at the top of the list. Yeah. But the corollary to that is all the pictures that I showed you, if you look really carefully, were taken by other people. Okay. Well, yeah, if, if to put yeah, in my, um, in we my can, slideshow, well, but but I'd have to get permission from them again. If, absolutely, if yeah. And just let yeah. me know who needs to be presented because we do want to give credit where uh, where it's due. Leanne, <laughs> if you uh, if if you have a gallery view and you see Carrie's picture, yeah, you see Carrie's. That's my that's my photo from when we were out. Nice. Uh, yeah. A week ago. A little bitty ago. fluke, or yeah, the little bitty. At least you could the little the little, yeah. So I mean we can we can give you some blue whale pictures because because okay. he has attributed all these to somebody else so we probably yeah okay. okay if you have a favorite one I don't think I Rodrigo might be difficult to get hold of he doesn't check his email very often okay but, um, I, m many of the others I can I can definitely shoot them an email and ask for permission to include it somewhere else and they would probably be be happy with that okay. But yeah, I said fluke, but I meant Finn, that little bitty, I, I have my cursor over it. So you have no yeah. idea seeing what I <laughs> do. Yeah. But yeah, the little bitty Finn. And... All right, well, again, thank you. I guess we're- Yes, thank you very much. It was done. nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank Super. you, Trevor. Best Great of luck to, to you. Thanks. Come to we'll San Diego. To I'm, I'm gonna send you Troy's contact information. He's got a yeah. gorgeous boat. Yeah. It sounds wonderful. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, Cheers. I'm going to head out. Good luck. Right, bye. Good night. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity.